Take your Bibles, if you would please, and open to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. We have been looking at the uh, Beatitudes. We'll continue to do that this evening. Tonight, as we uh, come to verse number 8, Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's kind of interesting the way that it is stated, and it's amazing to me as the Lord begins to give the uh, direction here. One of the very first things as he's beginning his, uh, the, uh, uh, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, basically, he has been doing a number of things already in the uh, surrounding areas where he is living. He has come to a point now where not only is he doing things, he says, but I, I need people to understand how I think and what's going to help them in their daily lives. And so as he gathers them around, he begins to go through this process. One of the very first ones, of course, is poor in spirit. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we've looked at that already, but uh, those that uh, have a, a lack in their, uh, not, when I say their spirit, it's kind of uh, in verse number three, blessed are the pure in spirit. Notice the uh, word spirit is not capitalized. Uh, so it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about your spirit and my spirit. Uh, in that instance, if you're going to be poor in spirit, that means that you have a lacking there. And thereby, you're going to work on what it's going to take to fill that lack and to uh, supply and fulfill that. So blessed are the poor in spirit when you realize that uh, that's the case. You begin to uh, foster and work on that somewhat. Because it goes on to say, for theirs is a kingdom of heaven, which is kind of interesting because that's talking about God's will here on this earth. And uh, then it goes on, uh, the next one is they that mourn. In other words, you have a, an empathy and sympathy and you're able to uh, somewhat walk in someone's shoes. Blessed are the meek, those that are consistent and uh, stay the same all the time. Then it goes on to say, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So you begin to uh, put a uh, circumference around you of righteousness and uh, the things that you do, the things that you say, the things that you take in, the things that you read, the things that you see, the things that you talk about, and so on and so forth, that just circumference you around. Uh, so blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, last week we looked at uh, those that are merciful, those that uh, will uh, understand how to extend mercy along those lines. And tonight, uh, it's kind of, uh, and I, I like the way that, that is phrased because it says, blessed are the pure in heart. The word pure in this particular instance, as I begin to uh, follow the Greek word, uh, it basically uh, just means that, clean, clear. Uh, for you and I, probably a, a, a easier way to understand this may be this, no, hid, no hidden agendas, no hidden agendas. And so in that instance, not only do you have a, a, a clean and pure heart, uh, David kind of gave us some direction along those lines because if you... When you begin to look through scripture to use that word, it is oftentimes, uh, David uses it probably more than anybody. It's only used about 10 times in scripture along this line in the, in the uh, Old Testament and New Testament. So let's take a couple looks at uh, how, uh, how David uses it. So take your Bible, if you would, and uh, turn back to the book of Psalms just for a minute. Psalm chapter number 19. Psalm chapter number 19. We'll start there and we'll look at a couple verses and then we'll turn to the New Testament just for uh, time's sake. So Psalm chapter number 19. The Lord has given us some uh, clear direction about his word and giving us uh, some understanding of it, but he uses the, the very same word here as uh, David is beginning now, familiar passages of scripture. And uh, the truth is, uh, I recall these verses simply because they were put to a song. And, uh, but let's begin in verse number seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That, that's, uh, every time I read that phrase, it reminds me of uh, one of the, the first churches that I pastored there in Winchester, Indiana. The buildings had been purchased. They had initially had been a uh, somewhat of uh, a school building, and uh, there were three sections to it. There was a, a section on 
uh, on, the, on the west side, a section on the east side, and then the main auditorium was kind of in the middle, uh, but it, it, uh, it was a schoolhouse, and, uh, or they had used it, they had it, it built it for school purposes. So when the title deed changed, even though the price had been paid, it still looked like a school. So what had to be done is they had to go in there and begin to convert it into a church. So what used to be one thing now was converted into something else. I think it's kind of interesting when the Lord Jesus purchased you and I, he had to move in and begin to convert our old wicked soul <laughs> into something that's completely different. And so uh, scripture reminds us how that's going to take place. So the more that you let the law of the Lord, all right, scripture and things begin to convert you, it will begin to change things. The word soul here is uh, not talking necessarily about your, uh, it is the never dying part of you that makes you unique. Everyone has one, saved or lost. But in that instance, your soul, talking about the seat of emotions, the place where uh, you, uh, you emote with each other and connect. So the law of the Lord is perfect and it will begin to convert or change your soul, who you are when it all boils down. So I, I know people say all the time, well, I'm just who I am. Well, stop it. Nobody likes you. We, we want a better version of you, I guess you will put it like that. And the, the scripture reminds us of that. At, uh, he is constantly in the process of changing who we are into a better person if we allow him to do it. He's interested in doing that and making us the best that we can be. And uh, who, what, what branch of the military for the longest time had that uh, be all that you can be? Was it in the Army? In the Army. Is that what it was? All right. And uh, in that instance, I'm not saying that the Army is going to make you the best you, but uh, in that instance, uh, Scripture can make you a much better you. So as we go on just a little bit further, it says, uh, let me begin verse number seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. By the way, that's free. That didn't cost you anything. It's not even in my notes. It's just uh, the testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. Verse number eight is the one that we want to look at. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is, and here's the word, pure, enlightening the eye. Now that's interesting because that tells us exactly what's taken place in the book of Matthew. Where are they? And I, this is the one night I didn't put the hanky in my pocket. Hang on, I've got something going on here. Cherith Ann, I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to blame her because one, she's not here, but she's infamous for taking the box of Kleenexes. <laughs> So, all right, wonderful. We'll go on from here. Verse number eight, and I can see where the Lord Jesus would have taken Matthew chapter number five exactly from this verse. Because the verse that we read is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Notice the, the end of verse number eight, it says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So he goes on to say the fear of the Lord is the uh, uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. And Scripture reminds us here that uh, David is he is pinning these things down. He is reminding us in verse number eight the statutes of the Lord, His word, are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. It has no hidden agenda. It is honest and laid out before you. God will tell you right up front, I'll take you just as you are, but I'm not going to leave you right where you're at. He makes it very clear. His intent is to make you and I the better version of us, if I can, if I can use that term. He is constantly trying to make us more like his dear son. Uh, so we're not only made in his image, he wants us to be, begin to portray who he is and allow the, the working of the Holy Spirit and the word of God to cleanse us from the inside out. So in that instance, God is reminding us of that very thing. And uh, you're right there in the book of Psalms. Turn over to chapter number 24. Chapter number 24. And look, if you would, please, in verse number 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So he is making it, uh, once again, he is using that phrase. 
a pure heart. In other words, you don't have an agenda in what you're doing. You try to see people and see things and circumstances and situations, not just always looking for the negative, not always looking for the, the thing that is problematic, not always finding the, the, uh, the, the bad side of things. I know we use the expression, you know, playing devil's advocate when we're trying to maybe look through all the circumstances that may be in front of us, but there comes a point where we need to consider that and say, you know, we don't always have to look for just the bad that's there. We can try to find the positive that could be there and, uh, and go from there just a little bit because the Bible reminds us, you know what, if you have, if you want to make sure that when he uses the term clean hands, in other words, there's nothing there that's going to uh, cause the Lord some, some difficulties. Uh, if you want to know what some of those are, you can turn to Proverbs chapter number 6 and find out these six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. Steer clear of those and uh, steer clear of those that are going to be around those and steer clear of those that would, would uh, promote those and encourage those. And let's go a little further. Pass legislation in positive for them. And so in that instance, it just reminds us that when I uh, have to write a letter to my congressman or write a letter to my senator or write a letter to the governor or uh, consider what I'm doing, I have to consider those things. Because if my hands are going to be clean, I've got to make sure that I'm going to keep that in mind too. So in that instance, and a pure heart. In other words, Lord, I want the best for everybody. I don't want anybody to have to go through uh, hardship and difficulty. But fully know that, guess what? Hardship and difficulty sometimes teaches us the lessons that nothing else will. So in the process of doing that, it's like, Lord, would you do this? If so-and-so, if my friend, if my loved one, if my family has to go through this, I'm not opposed to it. Just go with us. And so in that instance, it makes, it makes everything better. It, as ugly as it is, the three Hebrew children being thrown in the fiery furnace, but when Jesus shows up, it changed everything. Amen. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and it wasn't because those lions were not hungry and were not ready to eat. It was just the Lord was with him. And so in that instance, uh, the scripture reminds us that the crew that, that made the decree that caused Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den, the king grabbed them up, threw them down in there, and... Scripture says before their, before their body hit the ground, them lions were crushing their bones. So keep in mind that uh, when the Lord shows up in the middle of your difficulty, that's what you want. Because sometimes those difficulties, those circumstances, and those situations are not pleasant. And we wouldn't want to go through them. The truth is we oftentimes say, Lord, I, I really would prefer not to go through them. But at the same token, if you don't, then you don't get his presence like you normally would have or like you could have. So in that instance, just go with us. Now, turning to the New Testament, let's look at a couple uh, passages if we could. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. I always have to find the book of Hebrews and then turn back a few pages. And so, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Look, look if you would please in verse number 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. So scripture is reminding us that one thing in this particular instance, the end of the commandment or scripture, how it can be fulfilled is charity out of a pure heart. Not having an agenda behind it. I don't do what I do just because I'm trying to manipulate somebody. I do what I do because I want the best for them. And uh, in whatever manner it is. Look, I've, I've <laughs> there have been folks that have asked me questions and I have answered what I thought would be best for them, not the best for someone else or best for the church or best for anything along those lines. What I mean by that is they say, well, what should I do with this? And uh, sometimes I have to, I look at it, it's like, okay, well, that could really benefit over here. But the truth is, this is really what needs to be done. And uh, in that instance, so you have to uh, kind of weigh that out just a little bit and make sure that, that there's no agenda behind uh, the direction and advice. That means you can't be the used car salesman every time you're doing something. And uh, I, 
How many have ever had the phone ring, you answer it, and the person on the other line says, I'm calling about your uh, warranty on your vehicle. And so you ask them, which vehicle are you talking about? Uh, your most recent one. Well, which one? And uh, it's like, they're all kind of recent, but uh, well, and then they, they don't have information along those lines. Now, I know what warranties I have on my vehicle. And it was hilarious because this little lady was going to argue with me that I did not have a warranty that I knew that I had already had. And uh, she was telling me, no. <laughs> Isn't it hilarious? And uh, it's, it, it would be like somebody telling me, oh, you're not saved. You don't know it. It's like, look, you can say it all day long. It ain't going to be true. Just because a person says a thing a thing, don't make a thing a thing. So in that instance, Scripture is reminding us here in this particular verse, now the end of the commandment is clarity, or excuse me, charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Now, uh, Timothy is, is uh, it is mentioned, Paul is mentioning this to Timothy and reminding him of that. And uh, turn over just a few more pages to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Blessed are the pure in heart those that don't have an agenda in what they do and how they do it. For if you can make that adjustment, you'll see God. Now, you're not going to physically see him, but you'll see his hand of working. I, I, I've got four things I'll mention to you here as we get a little bit closer to the end, but I want to take some time to explain something a little more. Notice, if you would please, in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, and look at verse number 22, if you would please. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So in this particular instance, Peter is introducing that very same concept. If you're going to love somebody, love one another with a pure heart, but fervently. And so in that instance, don't have a hidden agenda behind what is there. Uh, just do it because that's what needs to be done. And uh, in that instance, uh, you, you can, by the way, every single thing that we mentioned, pure in spirit, mourn, those uh, meekness, hunger and thirst, merciful, pure in heart, all are possible through an effort if you and I will put, it for, put forth that effort. It all can be obtained so that God's blessing, and by the way, as we've defined blessing in a number of different ways, it's, it's having the attention and favor of God. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to go through difficulties. It just means God will be there with you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. It just means God will be there with you. And so in that instance, it is reminding us of that very thing. Now, let me show you the example that we have in Scripture. So take your Bible, if you would, please, and we'll spend a little time here. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. Pure in heart. Chapter number 37, beginning in verse number 12, we see the life of uh, a young man named Joseph. Joseph is beginning his life, and uh, as he begins, he's got a number of brothers, and these, <laughs> these brothers conspire against him because he has dreamed a dream. And in the process of dreaming that dream, he has told his brothers what this dream is. Now, it was somewhat a prophetic statement by God. And uh, in that instance, uh, he told and thought, why wouldn't they be happy about this? See, his pure in heart was this. If I benefit, I'll just benefit you. But they're not looking at it that way. They're looking at the, oh, you just think you're better than we are. He was coming at it from the aspect of, if, if, if it turns out good for me, I'll make it turn out good for you. You see, the, most of us, we don't usually live like that a great deal. The reason, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask, but I want you to think about this just for a second. On occasion, uh, you that work in the workforce, you know that usually about every year, maybe two or something along those lines, whether it's a contract nego ne negotiation or just a uh, cost of living increase or something along those lines, but uh, your company may say, we're going to give you a raise. And uh, in that instance, now, 
depending upon who you work for and how uh, those circumstances roll out, if the company does better, you may do better. And I know we look at it like, well, if the company does better, the, the, the owners do better, but we don't do much better. No, it's, it's wonderful to be able to work at a place where if they do better, you'll do better. That is, uh, that is a, a positive of, <laughs> that is a positive of capitalism and it is the demise of communism. And so uh, in that instance, and the, and the bad part about it is uh, a great deal of our young people today have no idea. They've won't, and by the way, they've, they've read very little about it. Because it works like this. If, all right, if you, uh, if you have investments in the stock market right now, uh, you're probably doing a little bit better than you have before. Because as it increases, you'll increase. God is reminding us in this particular instance, and Joseph is coming from it from this aspect. He says, man, if I, if I do well, if God blesses me, I'll just make sure everybody has a blessing. But the, the brothers are looking at it like this. Well, if I get better, then it's mine. But notice as we, as we come to verse number 12, we'll begin the, uh, uh, the previous verses before that. Tell us a little bit about Joseph and uh, some of the dream that he's had. But we come to verse number 12, and it says, his brothers went to feed his, uh, their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he, said to him, uh, and he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he, uh, so he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and he asked him, uh, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, uh, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, uh, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph uh, went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, huh, the opposite of a pure heart, they conspired. So in this instance, we see here that Joseph, with a pure heart, tells his dream in hopes that they would be excited about what the Lord is going to do, but instead, they conspire. And we see here against him to slay him. Now, the next few verses, they were intending to do that. Reuben says, don't kill him. And uh, so they decide to throw him into a pit. As Reuben's away, uh, Judah says, well, you know, here comes some merchants. Let's just sell him. At least we can get some money for him, and that's what they do. So when Reuben comes back, they explain what's done. And so look at verse 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, and he returned to his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, uh, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. See the evil behind these things? They were now causing great difficulty for their father in the loss of what he thought was the loss of his son. As we go just a little bit further, we see that that was not necessarily the case. And uh, look at, uh, well, it's uh, Judas talked about in chapter number 38. Go to verse no, or chapter number 39. Joseph, of course, was not dead. He was sold into uh, slavery there. And as he uh, traveled just a little bit further, uh, because the, the last verse in chapter number 27, or 37 tells us, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt under uh, Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So chapter number 39 Verse number one, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Notice verse number two, and the Lord was with Joseph because of his pure heart, because he did not have agenda, because when he was going to see his brother, that was not the case. So we see here in verse number two, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse number four. Notice this. Even when he was in a place that he didn't want to be, God was still with him. Even doing things that he would have preferred not to do, 
he still worked as unto the Lord so that uh, he could continue to have that pure heart. He said, look, you, you can either just say this place is just awful or you can make that awful place a little better because you're there. So in that instance, Joseph just decided, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to make the best of this. Verse number three tells us, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. I wonder how he saw that. Because Joseph wasn't always angry. He wasn't always mad. He wasn't always with that agenda of, boy, as soon as I get a chance, I'd kill this guy. Now, he may not have been happy, and I'm sure that he was not pleased to be a slave. But at the same token, slave or not, he still had God all over him. And in that instance, no matter what circumstance you and I find ourselves, we can still have God with us in a very mighty and powerful way, even to a point where, uh, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Notice, after that, verse number four, and Joseph found grace in the sight. Isn't that interesting? Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Notice, grace was extended his way. And that meant that his life was going to be a little bit easier. Boy, it's strange how that when God shows up, it's just interesting how things uh, are, are a little bit more on the positive side. Verse number six, because now here's Potiphar, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Isn't that interesting? He is, he is now over the entire, uh, in the entirety of Potiphar's house. He said, I don't even know what I have except the bread that I'm eating. Joseph takes care of all of it, and I trust him. He had no agenda. So in that instance, he said, well, if, if I do well, then everybody around me can do well. In that instance, some wickedness is getting ready to find him and come after him. And that's exactly what takes place in verses 7 all the way down through verse number uh, 17. Notice in verse number 18, because uh, Potiphar's wife tried, to, uh, uh, tried to, to, to cause some great wickedness with Joseph. Verse number 9, uh, it tells us, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? And sin against God. See, he didn't look at just his circumstances and said, this is where I'm at. He was looking at the bigger picture and says, look, I'm working for God in this whole thing. That's what helped him with his uh, pure of heart. So we come down, a little, you say, but he, he, he was lied. He, it, it, they, they, can, they treated him badly. It wasn't the first time in his life he'd had it happen. But God was still with him. Because we see in verse number 20, and Joseph's master took him. And put him in prison. He went from the highest place he could be in the house to prison. A place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that strange? And showed him mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison uh, looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Huh. You can just keep reading about the whole thing, and that's exactly what takes place. Until finally, you know, the, you know probably the story a little bit about Joseph. He told the, uh, there was a, uh, a butler and a baker that was thrown into prison down there with him. They had a dream. Joseph tells them the dream. And uh, gives him the, the interpretation of it. And it comes true. We then come to chapter. And Joseph told him, look, just remember me when, you, when you're reinstated, would you? And the butler said, you got it, Cap'n. <laughs> Notice what happens in chapter number 41. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And all of a sudden the butler said, oh, yeah. Hey, there was a guy that told me my dream. Man, that was a while ago, wasn't it? He said, Two full years. Boy, that's a, that's a big thanks. Joseph still wasn't angry. 
Isn't that incredible? Because sure enough, he calls him up. He tells Pharaoh the dream. And he makes it very clear. He says, it's not me that's doing it. It's God that is telling you this dream. And uh, he makes that very clear in chapter number uh, 41. Because we see the events that take place. Verse number 17 says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And so Pharaoh is now telling him the dream. And uh, as he goes a little bit further, uh, look at verse number 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So he made it very clear, this is not me, this is God. Joseph still didn't have an, an agenda. In that particular instance, Pharaoh finally, the dream, comes, uh, the dream comes true. Joseph is put in charge of everything, and now he is, he is second in command of all of Egypt. You know, about the time that all the difficulties that are going on, sometimes uh, the, the butler getting thrown into jail at that time, the baker, uh, they didn't think it was very positive, but it was all a working of God's hand to give Joseph an opportunity to, to be promoted. Let me give you four things very quickly, if I may. Because a pure heart means that you and I cannot have an agenda. Let me, let me, uh, let me give you four statements if I could. It, it reminded me of the very thing because 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 15, Paul is saying that I may spend and be spent for the cause of Christ. Sometimes somebody's going to take advantage of you. No need to hold an agenda. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Number one, your situation does not make you. You make you. doesn't matter where you're at. You can still have a pure heart in everything that is done. You can allow the word of God to help cleanse you from some of those things and be clean and clear and have no agenda behind what is done. And in that instance, your situation doesn't have to make you. It's, uh, you don't have to uh, allow it to put you into a state of mind. You can bring the state of mind into what is there because you make you. Number two, grudges, envy, and spite will rob your pure heart. Let me say it again. Grudges, envy, and spite will rob your pure heart. Matthew chapter 18 will tell you how to forgive. In that particular instance, number three, choose to work as unto the Lord. Choose to work as unto the Lord. In everything that Joseph did, it wasn't the fact that, that his boss was, uh, was Pharaoh. It wasn't the fact that his boss was Potiphar. It wasn't the fact that none of that. It was, he was working as unto the Lord. And in that, that helped him to keep a clean heart with no hidden agenda. And then lastly, it's difficult to see God through the glasses of a grudge and resentment. It's difficult to see God through those glasses of grudge and resentment. So when scripture says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, just keep in mind, Joseph had a reason to hold a grudge, but he did not, and therefore he saw God. He had a reason to resent the circumstances that he was in, but he didn't. And therefore, he was able to see God. Just keep in mind that uh, sometimes those grudges that you're holding, you're going to put that on, and you won't be able to see God. You say, well, I, I know, but it, it brings me comfort to, to hang on to this hatred. <laughs> you say, well, that's not what I mean. That's what you're doing, though. And the resentment that I feel, I understand, those are real. But the truth is, if you can set those things aside, sometimes you'll be able to see God a whole lot clearer than otherwise. The truth is, as Scripture says right here, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you can keep, that, uh, keep those agendas out of it and uh, allow your, no, don't allow your situation, your circumstance to make you, you make it. Those grudges, envy, and spite is just going to rob you of your pure heart. Work as unto the Lord. And uh, as he's the, he's the boss, in that instance, uh, you'll be able to then see him a whole lot more clearly. But it'll be difficult to see him through the glasses of grudge and resentment. And so keep those things in mind if you would. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed this evening. Please be cautious and careful always. Uh, mind your health. Be as safe as you can. Be as healthy as you can. And... Uh, Tell Cherith to quit taking my Kleenex from underneath my pulpit. <laughs>
All right. I know I'm accusing her. It may not even have been her. So, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for your gracious kindness and mercy. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just bless now. Thank you again for all that you do. And Lord, we ask that you'd please help those that were mentioned tonight, every single name. Lord, is attached with a need. So I do ask that you'd please help the, everything to be done according to thy will. We ask now for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be dismissed.